gentlemen of Hoyt, it's your turn to have a go. I'm a good old pal, Wally McNichols. Greeting you from the border town of Hoyt in Roxfordshire. It lies on the main road between Carlisle and Edinburgh. The Hoyt's main trade is the fashioning of fine knitwear and the weaving of superlative tweeds and rugby football. And ladies, you know those lovely Scottish knitted jumpers, sweaters and twin sets? Well, this is where they're made. Some of the best known manufacturers have their factories in Hoyt. This means, of course, that there's a lot of work for women. In fact, in the town of Hoyt, there are more women than men. And I might say that no young man here gets married these days on ten pounds a week. Oh, no. She has to be earning twice as much as that. <laughs> and it was here that Mr. McPherson had three daughters. And one day to the house came young Angus McPhee. And Mr. McPherson asked him into the front room. He said, sit you down, Angus, and have a wee drum. And when Mr. McPherson went down, Angus said, he had three daughters. There's Jeannie, she's 23. When she marries, that will give her a thousand pounds. Then comes Margaret, she's 32. When she marries, that will give her two thousand pounds. Have another weed ram. And then he said, and now we come to Morag. She's 40. When she marries, that will give her three thousand pounds. And young Angus looked up at him and said, Mr. McPherson, have you not won about 50? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is the point where Harry Play is getting to know you, and then Mabel will introduce us to some of the people who live in the industrial border town of Hoyk. Well, let's start off with Alec Willans. He was born here. He's married with one child, and Alec thinks this is an ideal town to live in. Good evening, Alec. Uh, what advantages has this uh, town got that makes you think it's such a good place to live in? Well, amongst other things, I think uh, it's worth about 50 miles from Edinburgh, 50 miles from Carlisle, two cities. You've only got about 50 miles to go to the sea of Berwick. Um, we're a, a good sized town and about ten minutes or a quarter of an hour's walk in any direction, takes you out into the, the countryside. Now, we found uh, this to be an extremely friendly place. Everybody's been yeah. charming to us. Uh, can you give me any example of a spirit of friendship that exists here? Well, uh, I often think of it walking along High Park Street on a, a Saturday morning. Um, just about every second person I think that you meet is a friend, certainly someone that you know at least to know your head to. Uh -huh. uh, what's the job, I think? Uh, I'm a hand knitter. Uh, one of the factories? Yes, it's one of the factories. Uh, oh, do, do a hand knitter, would that mean that that sort of garment might be more expensive than that machine knitted garments? Uh, yes. There, sometimes I think that they'll be subsidised. They'll, they'll subsidise the, um, the hand knitted garment. In order to attract all this for the for the thing that you got. Mm. Now, when we finish and the thing, what are you this? Well, aren't we? You love me, of course. Ah, of course, you're a great team here, aren't you? Yes. Now, yes. You, to give a real thrill out of fishing, Alec, where would you be fishing? Well, one of my favourite places is away up in the hills, a bit TV Ted, but nine miles from work. And I don't think there's anything can beat uh, sitting at the river bank on a good summer's day with nobody in your hand except maybe the sheep and the goats. <laughs> <laughs> you know the story about the little lad who went out on Sunday afternoon and he was coming along with a string of trout and Robert was suddenly confronted with a local minister. And I was going to escape, of course, and the boy took to the occasion and went up to the minister and said, Minister, 
Do you see what these two get for having worms on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> Now, very famous for rugby here. Have you ever travelled at all to see the other famous clubs, say, famous uh, rugby players in Scotland or Wales? Well, there was an occasion for oh, it. was four years ago, my wife and I went down to, to Cardiff to see Wales play Scotland. And um, there was. It, it was suggested to us at night that we go and see the Empire Pool. And we went to the Empire Pool. And, I must say it's a marvelous universe. We were really not seeing it today. And um, in the cafeteria afterwards, we heard that something I like to pay with spirit for it with a Scottish pound note. And of course, the waitress would get in it. <laughs> so I asked to see the manager, and he came on the scene, and it was no go with him either. <laughs> so in the end, my wife had to fork out the fork bus and because I didn't have any change. Well, the train coming home, we start the station at about just behind 12, just about the 12 o'clock at night. And uh, I was standing in the front of the queue in the cafeteria again. And there was a lot, lot of people behind us. And I ordered what I wanted and just lying out in the counter. And of course, I picked up the Scottish pound note again. And the same thing happens. The waitress refuses to take the Scottish pound note. And of course, she went away and got the uh, uh, house superior. And they had a corn farm. And uh, in there, they decided to take it. <laughs> but on the whole, it was a pretty poor deal. Pretty poor deal. Next time you got to work, you will try and pass it up as a pound, but yes, I'll try it. There's an only question again. The next ten shillings if you get it right, you see. It's as if you were trying to drink a cup of tea in the dark. On which side of the cup would you feel for the handle? Yes, the outside. That's it. Give him the money, mate. <laughs> Elson is 75. She came here from Oxfordshire just after the First World War. Her husband was groomed to Edward, Prince of Wales, now the Duke of Windsor. If you miss by any chance to answer that question, if you were trying to drink a cup of tea in the dark, on which side of the cup would you feel the handle? And it came to the right hand from the outside. Good evening, Mrs. Elson. How are you? Definitely. I'm very well, thank you. Wilfred, may I call you Wilfred? Yes, sure, please. Uh, now, may we mention Edward, Prince of Wales? Was your husband very fond of Prince Edward? Yes, he admired him very much indeed. I think everybody did. And he was very proud to be in his service. Now, I believe Prince Edward was the type of chap who used to snap his fingers at convention during his stories about his rebellious actions. Oh, yes, definitely. As uh, you may be aware, when he walked the streets in Oxford, Two detectives walked behind him. Well, on this occasion, he was going in to be fitted for a new suit. He walked into the shop and told the detectives to wait for him and he would be out. He went into the cubicle to be measured and he gave the man that was measuring a nice check and walked out through the back door and disappeared. They <laughs> didn't find him until the next day. <laughs> <laughs> what made the oxygen for Mrs. Elton? Well, the girl came along, Wilfred, and my husband with all the other grooms joined out. They didn't get home until the war was over. And the prince had no establishment, no horses, there was no work down there. This was his hometown in industrial city, and we came to horse. Now, you're walking with a stick. You don't mind mentioning that. No, Can you tell me what's wrong? Oh, yes. I had a very bad motor accident some years ago. Other injuries, I suffered with a fractured femur, and I lay in Peel Hospital over a year. Well, I hope it soon gets well. You look well enough. No, I'm fine myself. Thank you, Wilfred. Have you any family there? Oh, yes. I have five boys and a girl. And where are they? Well, I have four married sons in the town, and they're terribly good to their mother. And I've one son in America, which is in a position that he was able to buy me a house. Ah, so you don't live with any No, no, no. Old and young don't mix, Wilfred. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me go now, please. 
you want to let you back up quite a bit. What are you, what are you hoping? Well, I live next door to the public library. I read a lot. And I do the crossword puzzle. And I also compose and write a bit. What sort of stuff do you write? Well, pose, poetry, and I've written a play, which I don't know what to do with. Well, I'll read it for you. Uh, no, you talk about poetry. Could you, could you pick one of your own poetry, a little short one, and give it to us? Oh, yes, if you'd like it, Wilfred. Very much. I am not growing old. You tell me I am growing old, but that's not really so. The house I live in may be old. That, of course, I know. It's been in use a good long while, and it's weathered many a gale. I'm therefore not surprised to find it's getting somewhat frail. You tell me I'm getting old. You mix my house with me. You're looking at the outside, and that's all that most folks see. The dweller in this little house is young and bright and gay, just waiting on the dawn of day, a long eternal day. I patch the old house up a bit to make it last the night. But soon I will be flitting to my home of endless life. I'm going to live forever there. My life goes on. It's grand. How can you say I'm getting old? You do not understand. These few short years can't make me old. I feel I'm in my youth. Eternity lies just ahead. Few life and joy and truth. <laughs> Now, these lovely people that you look after, 
So what? How many have you got there? Old ladies? Uh, Forty-six. Okay, okay. Forty-six. I thought it was uh, your way of decor redecorating and done it up. It looked extremely comfortable and charming. Well, we have done quite a, um, um, some little decorations, but there's very much more needed. Yes. And, um, but of course, we have to go very slowly because we have to just wait and cut our cloth according to our pattern. Of course. Well, let's hope some work the cafe just they might uh, take a bit. Uh, uh, yes, because of the good work of the the promotion, you might well. send you a good check, we never know. Uh, oh, where were you born? I was born in County Down, in Northern Ireland. I know. Quite near Belfast. You're a star of a candidate. <laughs> 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 well, about the dear old ladies of the St. Margaret, we know they're listening tonight. I have some of your friends and relatives in Ireland are listening. Yes. Reverend Mother, thank you for coming along. Congratulations on the wonderful work you're doing. Charles Duff worked for the Tweed Mills. He was born in jail. He's married with a daughter and three grandchildren. <laughs> Yeah, I never said you were born in jail. Were you in jail in the 1930s? Yes. Then you knew what it was like? Yes. Because there was no unemployment in that town or any other town in Great Britain. Well, in 1926, there was a noble strike. And it was Ellen Wilkinson who called it the town that was murdered. That's correct. Right. You didn't bother marching? No, no, I was too young. Now, this bear is tweed, as a manufactured here. Do you know where the foreign continent is exported to? Well, I've heard it in America and all the European countries. And we like to get far out of the field, too, if we could. Ah, and now, you, you lived in the jail, but what brought you to Hoyt? Well, the sister was right with uh, three young children. They uh, come up to help support her. And, and then I've been to a young Scots girl and got married, and here I am. So you married a Scots girl? Oh, yes. Do Scots girls make good wives? I mean, are they thrifty? Yes, very. They're all good. Yes. I knew a fellow who had to take his wife to class. He said, you know, we've got to be more economical. He said, listen, if I were to die tomorrow, where would you be? She said, well, I'd be here. The question is, where would you be? <laughs> now, living in a part of the world, Charlie, that's surrounded by lovely countryside, what do you enjoy doing most of the weekends? Well, I like fishing, but my chief hobby is bird watching. Bird watching is? Yeah, I like that, too. It's good work. <laughs> Down it on the corner. Yeah, and other, some of the other people migrate to birds in this part. Well, nearly all birds are migrated, bar that a sweet kind of a sparrow and a blood bird. Every other bird is migrated, but and there's a multitude here. A multitude of birds. Yes, beautiful, beautiful country for it. <laughs> what about the war? Did you say the forces? Yes, from 1939 to 1946. And which regiment were you in? The Fanny Sword. First Kings on Scottish borders. Did you get back any fierce fighting? Sometimes in the canteen. <laughs> because we were only so out of the lab, you know, the, the, the battle was on, it was really getting hot. And he kept saying to himself, I wish my mother was, had been right. And then again, he said, I wish my mother had been right. And the fellow said, what do you mean you wish your mother had been right? He said, well, before I was born, she was sure I was going to be a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, good luck to the, uh, to the bird watching. And tell me this, this is, this is another bird. You get ten more bits to this. Why is a hen sitting on a fence like a halfpenny? <laughs> You don't know. No, that's one bird you don't know. Watch it. Give him the money, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Margaret Graham is 48. She's two sons and a daughter, and I'm sorry to say she's a widow, and that meant she had to go back to work in one of the factories here. <laughs> Hello, Margaret. That's a lovely reception. You're very popular here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> they know you. Well, Mary was right. You're very young to be a widow. Uh, 
Italian children, a 1622 Now, you've got to, you've gone back to work. Mm -hmm. Is it the old job that you used to look for? Uh, is it in all the knitting where they make these large babies? Tweeds, yes. Uh, what time do you start in the morning? What time do you finish at night? Eight till five. Eight till five? Mm -hmm. Well, and what do you do when you want to enjoy yourself? What do you do? Well, the bingo. The question is, have you, have you ever won anything at bingo? Oh, yes, uh huh. How much have you won? Uh, the biggest? 46 pounds. That's very nice, too. 46 pounds. Now, have you ever got a baby to call it over? How old is the daughter? 22. 22. Now, as a mother of a daughter, what's your opinion? Of the girls who scream at the Beatles. Oh, them girls. <laughs> what would you think of your daughter? What sort of line would you think if she screamed? Or is she the type that wouldn't? Oh, no. No. She wouldn't? No. Well, now, why do you think these girls do scream? Because they can. I do not care. Well, you know, it was a young fellow with long hair, you know, like these types we see in here. And he said to his pal one day, he, he paid him time. He said, Here is it took me three years to discover I couldn't play an honest note of music and I couldn't sing. And his pal said, So you gave it up? He said, No, I couldn't. I was too famous. <laughs> Three children, and you're going alone, back and bringing them up alone. What advice would you offer to youngsters, shall we say, at about 19? Enjoy yourself fast before you get married. Enjoy yourself before you get married? Mm -hmm. How old were you before you got married? Two. I mean, not before you got married, how old were you when you got married? Uh, 26. 26. And mm -hmm. you think that's about the right age? Uh huh. You did. Right. Well, falling in love, you'll never stop with me, now that's a total mm -hmm. mess. I know that I've been high here, a young couple would be walking up about six weeks. And one day they were walking out in the evening, she whispered in his ear and she said, uh, Do you love me still? He said, Well, I might if you keep still. <laughs> now, I've been married. Why is the head sitting on a fence like a head neck? Still do I'm saying it's head and head. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> Sitting in the audience is one of the ministers of the Church of Scotland in Hoyt, and I'd very much like him to come up and have a word with me, if you will. Uh, he's the Reverend Dennis Medbeater. Have you any idea what, where the word came from? Well, certainly it's a Gaelic word, of course. And strictly speaking, I suppose it means a Saxon or a Southerner. And in the old days, Highland gentlemen, in fact, Highland people of any sort, regarded everybody who lived below the Highland line as Saturnite, even though they'd been born in Glasgow or Edinburgh Ball. <laughs> <laughs> now, you joined the Church of Scotland. Where was your first ministry? Uh, in Clydebank. And then did you come straight from there to here? I came from there here, yeah. Now, when you came to Hoyt, how did these proud Scots take to a Yorkshireman? Well, I'm bound to say, you've already said that they're a very friendly lot, and so they are. But it happened that when I came here, my congregation laid on a social to welcome me, and the person who presented the major speech of welcome was, was a fellow Yorkshireman, Eric Whitehead, the county director of music. And in his speech, he said, uh, Mr. Ledbetter, you and I are the two wisest people in this room. It was this room, too. He said, we're the two wisest people for three reasons. We're both Yorkshiremen who had the wisdom to cross the border. We both married Scots wives. <laughs> and we achieved the ultimate in wisdom when we decided to come and live in Hoyt. <laughs> Very good. 
Uh, how many churches are besides yours? Well, there are six other churches in Scotland besides my own. Do you all get on? We get on splendidly, yes. Um, in fact, there are four of us who, who run some Sunday night experiments in this town hall. We all came to the town together, and we were all rather perturbed at the lack of young people in churches. And so we got together and decided to take the town hall if the town council would let us have it, and they would very readily and very willingly. And we decided to have uh, an hour and a half of dancing here on a Sunday night for six months of the year. They could come in free, and the only price they had to pay was to listen to two ministers giving five-minute talks in the course of the evening. How did it work out? Well, we, we soon had a membership of over a thousand, and we have an attendance, an average attendance of 500 on a Sunday night. I think that's one of the most splendid ideas of the world. Well, Mr. Lendy, let's get back to Yorkshire for a bit, Mr. Adams. Tell me your favorite Yorkshire story. Well, I suppose my favorite Yorkshire story is the one which deals with the origins of the Yorkshiremen when King James the Sixth and First took over the United Kingdom. He was concerned with the property of saw in London, and so he, he sent a message back to Glasgow, send me down 40,000 pairs of brogues. These people have no shoes to their feet. Well, the message was rather messed about in transit, and when it got to Glasgow, it was 40,000 pairs of rogues. <laughs> so, so all the jails of Glasgow and round about were emptied of all the vagabonds, cutthroats, and rogues, and they were formed into a column and made march to London. When they got to Yorkshire, they decided they liked it so much that they decided to stay there, and that's how the Yorkshiremen began to be. I'm sure, but you've got a, a favorite Yorkshire story, too. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not saying that, but what I didn't like it was, it was the two fellows who were kind of bet. One it was supposed to be a haunted house, and he said, uh, I bet you five pounds he bet to spend the night there. And um, so he took it on, and he went to this house, at 12 o'clock, he's got and dressed with a ginger beer, went into bed, and suddenly he heard a voice, and the voice said, there's only thee and me. So he leapt out of bed with his hair standing up, and pulled his shirt on, and the voice said again, there's only me and me. He said, oh, if I can only get my pants on, there'll only be me. Money for a church. Thank you very much. And now let's go for Babe. Or, as a tale, tell us what is the jackpot tonight. Well, we've got a lovely joint of scotch beef and a tin of peppermint sweets which are made here locally, and one pound note. And from what we've heard, I think we'd better make it a Scottish note. Best case to be spent in Wales. <laughs> and here is the Jackpot question. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, which Scottish author wrote Whiskey Galore? Oh, I don't mind it. It was Mr. Buck. It was Charlie Buck, the bird watcher. <laughs> Thompson McKenzie, and so we come to the end of this week's live broadcast of Have a Go, which came to you from the industrial border town of Hoyt in Roxburghshire, with Mabel at the table, Harry Hudson at the piano, and the program presented by Stephen Williams. Uh, 